on Facebook right now for GMI Hub Live. This is our bonus, bonus Monday, the fifth Monday of the month. And this week, uh, this Monday, we are going to discuss instruments. And with us today, we have two fabulous, fabulous panelists. We have uh, right here in the GTA, we have Seppo Salmonen. Did I say it right? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I was close. It. I was close. I want to make sure I said it right. Oh, Seppo. <laughs> Seppo is our local drum artesian. If you don't know what that means, it simply means this guy makes drums, plays drums. He knows drums inside and out. And not only does he do that, he's he's drummed for uh, events like Promise Keepers or organizations like Promise Keepers for, what, 20 years? Yeah. He's yeah. also toured with the Penny Merchants as their drummer as well, correct? And yep. producer? Yep. He's also an award-winning producer and the founder of TRS Custom Drums. Welcome, Seppo. That's me. Hey, how are you? Awesome. And all the way from California, uh, I hope the weather's <laughs> nice out there. We have our proud Canadian who's representing us, of course, down there, Noreen Smith. Noreen is Hi. a vocal technician. She is, her strengths are solving specific vocal problems in a very quick, comprehensive way. And she's not here to talk about the voice as an instrument. Welcome, Noreen. Thank you. Great to be here. So, yeah. So I think what we'll do is we'll just start off is what makes a good instrument. Um, we'll start off with Seppo. What, what makes a good drum or good drum set? Oh, man. Okay. Well, again, I could take up the whole hour talking about this. But, we don't but want really, that. <laughs> I know. But remember we said you're dealing with an instrument. Like, this isn't... You know, and this is the old joke, like, hey, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of musicians on stage and a drummer, right? So they kind of get into the into the vibe where we're we're not a real musician or our instrument is just something that we hit with a stick, right? But uh, there is more to it. There is obviously more to it. Um, but you're really, and I don't know how this sort of pertain to like the guitars and the basses and all that kind of stuff, but you are basically playing an instrument that's just the sum of all its parts. So everything has to be working properly on it. You gotta have the good drum heads, good drum shells. You gotta know how to tune them for sure because you're dealing with an, with an acoustic instrument. So there's a lot of variables with that. Um, and yeah, you're only as good as your weakest link. So if you've got a cheap drum kit, it's gonna be a cheap drum kit. <laughs> and you're not gonna get a wide tuning range. We can go into all that stuff, but you know, I don't know how that pertains to, to vocals, but you know, but for drums, yeah, it all starts with having a good instrument for sure, 100%. Well, but what is a good instrument? Like, before we get Noreen to come in and talk about the voice, yeah. but what is an actual good sounding drum kit? Like, you know what? I mean, it depends on, uh, you know what? It depends on if you're talking studio or live. And generally the rule of thumb, and, and, and I use this a lot when I build drums and I tell guys, if you've got a good drum kit, top of the line, top shelf kit, it's going to sound good in about 80% of the rooms. And 20% of the rooms, there's just the acoustics in the room is just bad. You're not going to be able to make it sound good, no matter what it is. On a cheaper drum kit, it'll sound good in 20% of the rooms. And in 80% of the rooms, it's not going to tune up. Just because of the woods that are being used in the drum heads. And of course, if the drummer can't tune, same as if you can have a $5,000 custom-made guitar. But if those things aren't in, uh, aren't in tune, it's going to sound like that $20, I was going to say Kmart special, but... I don't know if anyone remembers Kmart, but you know, the old Sears, anyone remember Sears? Are they still around? You know I what actually, I mean? two years cheap... ago, I, two years ago, I actually had somebody show up with a little Sears drum kit for an outdoor show. And nice. they were sharing drum kits and they had to use that one. Come on. Oh, no, man. it was funny. Yeah, I have, I have a pixie kit in my shop just above the spray booth as my personal show kit. And it's about a, hundred dollar drum no. kit back then you know and i think it's probably worth more now because it's a collector's thing so maybe it's worth like 150 bucks you know i don't know right so anyways so yeah. hopefully that helped yeah so uh so noreen tell yeah. me what makes a great instrument your your voice is a good instrument well i mean on one hand the the range of what a good instrument sounds like is going to be fairly infinite in the individual but the characteristics of a good instrument are when when someone hears what 
they hear something that they want to do vocally in their head and their voice can do it. So they understand their voice on a deep enough level that they know, um, they understand, they understand their voice technically and artistically. So, um, you know, they know when to go to a breathy sound or when to put more volume in it or when, when to add vibrato and when to leave it out and how to tell a story with their voice. But then, also, sign of a good instrument, I think, is, is also being able to have longevity and not have your voice uh, stop working on you. Like, you start a tour and you get three shows in and your voice just stops working and you don't know why and you got to cancel shows. Um, having a good instrument means troubleshooting all of those sorts of aspects before you land in a spot like that so that you can be ready and do whatever, basically whatever you need your voice to do, you understand your instrument at a deep enough level that you can do it for as long as you want to. Wow. So then since you're on, explain a little bit more on the physics of the, the voice or the mechanical aspect of the voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are books and scientific papers written on this subject, but um, I do kind of have a super simplified way of describing the voice and kind of the, the physics and the science behind it. And most people can relate to having, um, having a, like a, the speaker you have in your house or on your TV or um, you have the woofer and the tweeter. And when it comes to manipulating sound waves and, and having control over that, we have, we have a woofer and a tweeter built into our voices in the human body, which is really interesting. So the, if, if you kind of feel your Adam's apple, the little bump on your neck, and the, so the space between where your vocal cords live in the larynx and the back of your tongue boosts the lower harmonics. So um, that's your woofer in your voice. And then the space inside your mouth boosts the higher harmonics, so that's your tweeter. So um, when people have control over both of those areas, they can manipulate sound waves and, uh, and kind of create the sound, the sounds that they're looking for. And most people don't know that, especially most people know about the tweeter aspect of the voice, but I find, I find that most people don't understand the, the woofer part. Most people, um, when they sing, they sing with the, the larynx kind of hiked up a little bit. So it's it, like if you, if you put your hand on your neck and you, you go to swallow, you're going to feel that bump pop up. And then if you, if you go to yawn, oh, you're going to feel that go down. And in really balanced singing, if you were technically balanced all the time, which you don't have to be, um, but as a home base, if you're technically balanced, your, your little larynx here should be in the middle, just neutral, wherever you are in your range. And that gives you so much con more control over, over the tonality of your voice. So yeah, most people understand that that by you know creating more space in their mouth and and low, dropping their jaw that they can boost certain high frequencies, but I I find most of my students don't like introducing them to this control over the lower harmonics is like a new thing because majority of people tend to unknowingly sing with a slightly high larynx. So the higher the pitch goes, the more this goes up with it, and it it adds so many muscles that don't need to be there and creates a kind of a tonality that isn't isn't always ideal and it tends to wear on the vocal cords and create issues and create you know if you're singing that way a lot it creates um, nodes or polyps or or some sort of vocal issue and it can you can do that here and there as an effect but but um, yeah that's one of the things I end up doing with a lot of my students for the first few lessons is just getting in touch with what do you have control over and then how does that 
how do those physics uh, come into play when it, when it comes to the final tone that you're going for? So it's kind of all mixed so up. I'll ask this quick question. Um, the, uh, the falsetto, is yeah. that part of the tweeter or is that a different, because they always say that's, think of the head tone to go high. So is that something different still or is that part of what you've been talking about? Yeah, that's, uh, that's more um, almost the absence of the woofer entirely is, is that. There's, uh, there's those lower harmonics are pretty much missing in falsetto. And um, whereas in more in like a, in a, a, what I would characterize as a belt sound or what I call a mix sound, um, you have aspects of both the whole time. But in falsetto or just a pure head voice, you're kind of, it's only, it's only here and, and the, we're kind of skipping some of the lower harmonics in the sound. Seppo, you had a question. Yeah, I was going to say, I just, I, I, I find it interesting where, you know, what, what, uh, what Rini was starting with when she said, you know, it's the, it's the range and it's the, it's the ability and being able to, uh, you know, uh, sing, I guess, for the whole, you know, evening or whatever, that longevity, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because I mean, that's what you worry about going back to the drum aspect of what you were talking about makes a good instrument. And that's exactly it. Being able to have, have a drum kit and we'll talk drums and percussion, you know, in, in general, but it's basically having having that instrument that you're going to be able to use it for the next 20 years or 30 yeah. years or 40 years or 50 years. And it's going to be uh, minimally serviced. It's going to last a long time. It's going to sound good. Uh, you're always going to have some sort of breakdown. It might be a cold for the singers or it might be a drum head going or drumsticks, you know, breaking or something. Um, but generally that kit or your voice or a guitar or whatever, you want it to last. I mean, if someone's going to put out thousands of dollars. I know you're not doing that with your voice necessarily, but you are because you're studying and you're learning and you're taking care of it. I've had a singer in my band that walked around with a scarf around his neck for, I think the whole year. Like he just, that was his, that was his thing, drinking tea and a scarf. And that was it. Like that, mm -hmm. was, because that's all he did. That was his career was singing. Right. And he's yeah. a guy I, uh, I toured with in Finland and this is, you know, and he's in his, probably in his fifties now, but he's been touring forever, still wearing a scarf, still drinking tea. That's what the, that was the thing. So you got to make sure that your instrument, whether it's a vocal th uh, thing or whether it's a, whether it's a guitar or your drum kit's going to last you for the next 20 or 30 years. Whereas yeah. I know with, with drums, you can always trade them in. Yeah. Voice, I can't, I, once, I've tried, if I could trade this voice it, in, I would. <laughs> yeah. Once you break it, it's, uh, it's, it can be recovered in most cases, yeah. but it, it's a lot of work and yeah. You need some professional help. Yeah, you can't just. So yeah, when buy you were talking about those, replace the drums. Right, I was saying, but when you said about the nodes and stuff like that, does that permanently harm vocals? Uh, it depends. Um, it depends on how long they've been there. Right. And how much, because because you can you want to think of it as kind of like a callus mm -hmm. that's formed, um, like a callus you get from breaking in a new pair of shoes. So. Right. Uh, the, the sooner you, you go to a professional and um, whether it's a, a doctor. And I, I also want to say it's really important that you find someone who not only is an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but uh, they have, but one of those, an ENT who has a separate fellowship in laryngology. So they've, they've actually studied specifically singers and they've made a specialty of it right. and I have I have one that I work with locally like I send him students and he sends me clients if they're singing related and um yeah there's sometimes it's it's just uh sometimes I can just work with it in a singing context and uh if it's a bad habit and muscles that just shouldn't be getting involved we can undo it just undo the damage just with retraining those muscle groups and getting them out of the way if they shouldn't be there. Um, and sometimes it's a combination of surgery and vocal training. Wow. So, and sometimes you need a speech language pathologist because their speaking voice is also affected, of course. And that's, it's a different part of the brain that controls 
Le left brain is speech and right brain is singing. So sometimes you need a combination of your, of your surgeon and your uh, singing, if singing is your thing, your singing teacher and your speech language pathologist. So sometimes it's a team effort. It just that's depends why, on how bad the damage is and how long it's been there. So I was going to say, that's why I don't stutter when I sing, but I stutter when I speak. Different side, different hemispheres. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Seppo, for yourself, yep. um, if you yep. can explain the, the physics behind the drums. Uh, okay, well, basically, if you're looking at, uh, you know, again, you, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You have woofers and tweeters in your voice, I guess. We can say the same for the drums. You got your kick drum, your snare drum, you got your high toms, and you got your cymbals. So you got this whole variance of sound. Um, you know, and, and really the physics is basically you're moving air between two membranes. So basically it's a drum shell, drum head on top, drum head on bottom. Uh, and the, that relationship of the tuning of the top head to the bottom head is going to either produce a sound that's going to be, if we're talking just tonally, it's either going to be a downward gliss or an even tone, or actually there'll be a pitch bend up. So that can be changed. And then of course, depending on what woods you're using in, in the shell uh, and what hardware is on the shell, that'll also determine, uh, you know, sustain characteristics, uh, timber and tonal characteristics, whether it's a, a fat sound or a really high sound. Um, and then the, the way that the inside of the shell is treated, you've got guys that are putting in, actually I just worked on, uh, on Neil Pert's kit, right? So all, all the inside of his shells had this vibrofibing, which they called, uh, which is basically fiberglass. So this stuff is like lined with fiberglass. So those drums are like, as you would think, they're just incredibly high pitched. They're very bright. They cut through a lot of stuff. And that was his sound because they're playing in front of 50,000 people. And that was his live kit. That was a very general kind of a thing. So those drums needed to cut. Whereas you get the jazz guy that's sitting in a little, you know, in a little club playing his little bebop jazz kit. And he just wants nice, warm, round sounds. So those shells will be, again, of a different construction and a different nature to bring out the sound that you need for the gig. I don't know how that works for vocals. I don't know if you can change your voice. I wish you could. Like today I'm going to sing like, I don't know, I was going to say Mariah Carey. It's the only one that came to mind for some reason. That's really bad, isn't it? Oh my God. Anyway, so sing like Mariah Carey or then uh, um, Aerosmith guy. Why can't I think of his name? <laughs> Aerosmith. Steven Taylor. Tyler. Tyler. Steven Tyler. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. so I wish I could do that. I wish I could change that up. You know, one day I'll go like, I'm going to be Mariah Carey, you know, but. Well, let's, let's, let's throw that at you, Noreen. Can you make your voice better and what does it take? Yeah, well, you can change style for sure. Yeah, there's, um, I, one of the things I do is style coaching. So I might have a student who. Uh, I recently had a student who um, did musical theater primarily, and she wanted to switch to uh, classical operatic sound. And so uh, we, what we do is just kind of deconstruct the elements of a musical style and then find a way to build that into the voice. Like uh, something, something as simple as vibrato. So, um, Jazz vibrato is a different, different one than uh, gospel music vibrato. Gospel vibrato is uh, like if, if this is your note you're singing, gospel music kind of goes a little bit sharp around it, but jazz vibrato might, might go like goes a little bit below. And then, you know, just it, it just comes with just deconstructing elements of those styles and then because I teach singers who are their rock and roll singers or they sing jazz or musical theater or choral music or country whatever they want to sing we we just kind of I work within their style but then every once in a while I have a student who wants to learn to sing a completely different style and um, and there are very interesting defining qualities of each style. So if someone wants to learn to do that, I've had, I've even had like screamo students and nice. yeah. we, just, we figure out how to make it work. So all the, all the elements of good vocal technique apply to everything. And then the elements of style are uh, just the thing that makes that style unique. So when I went in, I went in for vocal lessons, right? Because I've always wanted to say, 
I can play a lot of stuff. I can do a lot of things. I can't sing. It's the one gift that, thank you. For some reason I wasn't <laughs> given, you know? So again, it's not there. So I'm going in for these vocal lessons. So because I'm a drummer and I sing from behind the kit, the teacher was like, well, everything you're going to start practicing on, you're going to practice sitting down because you have to move your diaphragm, blah, 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 from sitting down or whatever. Yeah. And the thing we found out was that my voice, singing voice is in this lower baritone, I don't know what to call it, lower voice. Then you have alto, is that above baritone? Baritone, yep. alto. The baritone is generally a male designation and then alto is generally. So a I'm yep. singing like Sting or trying to sing like Sting and my voice is a baritone, yep. but I can't sing low because I feel like all of a sudden I'm singing in an opera. <laughs> so I want to sing high like the rock guys, but my voice doesn't cut it. So. I took about six months of that to find out like, yeah, there wasn't, there's not much help. So maybe, it was, maybe I should have spent more time. There's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's two sides of that. One is uh, a, a berry sax isn't going to sound like an alto sax, right. you know, like the, the instruments are shaped uniquely and differently and, and the, the different size makes all the difference. Um, but at the same time, um, vocal range can be built mm -hmm. so so you'll always sound the the darker baritone sound will always be part of it but vocal range can be added so you know someone who's like a female singer who's uh what's known as like a mezzo soprano it means they kind of they're kind of the female baritone they have a darker quality of voice they can have what's called coloratura notes, they can sing up in Mariah Carey whistle tones. They have the range, it's just their voice will always sound, uh, you know, with, it will always have those darker qualities. Right. So, so you potentially could sing if, you know, as you're, as we discover more vocal range, you can sing up in sting range, yeah. um, but he's a tenor. And so your voices will always sound a little different. Right, right. Okay. So if I train my voice, I can get nice and high. Yeah. Nice. There you go. There you go. Time for those online lessons, I think. Yeah. <laughs> now, that, now that I'm sitting around, not doing a heck of a lot, you know, it's like, <laughs> hey, why don't I just sign up? So I'll, I'll get your web address and we'll, we'll do some lessons. Show yeah. me, uh, I'll let you listen to some stuff. And then, mm -hmm. you know, after you stop laughing, then you can kind of tell me what. what I, never <laughs> I never laugh. I never laugh. Yeah. Okay, smirk. <laughs> well, whether you are a singer or a drummer or any other instrumentalist, this is the, the show you need to be tuned into. We are talking about what makes a good instrument. We're here with Seppo, who is a drum artesian, aka he builds drums, plays drums, knows all about drums. And we have Noreen, all the way from California. She is a vocal technician, and she's sharing everything she knows from top to bottom about Noreen, and we're learning a lot. So if you're here you know, share the experience. This is not a private conversation. Share the experience. Who knows? You might get a little vocal or drum lesson through this. So, there you go. All <laughs> so right. let's let, let's go to you, Seppo. We we're talking about yep. how to improve an instrument. How do you improve the sound of a drum kit? Since it's something. Uh, that you can get. Well, you know what? First thing, I mean, when I'm at the shop, the the most requested um, uh, thing when guys come in with their drums and they're like, "My drums sound like crap. What's going on?" So. The first thing they're going to look at is, is uh, if you're talking, aside from the drum head, obviously the drum head's key, number one, but the drum head sits on a bearing edge, which is basically you got the round cylinder and there's a shape to that, uh, to that edge where the drum head sits. And different companies will have different cuts. So, you know, you can have a standard 45 cut that's really sharp. So it goes up and then down. Hey, that looks cool on the screen. Look at my hands. Anyway, so uh, sorry, a little ADD right there. It's like, woo. So anyway, so you have the drum shell comes up and it'll come down 45 or you can have a, like a round over or they've got, you know, a 45 with a round over kind of thing. And all that will, will change the sound of the drum uh, within reason. So basically if the drum is not tuning, if you take the drum and you put it on a flat surface and they say, you know, you put a light on the inside of the drum and you check on the surface. If you can slide a business card under there so you see a little bit of a wave when the drum head sits, it's not gonna be able to tune in that section because there's no marriage between the head and the shell. So now you get that kind of floppy kind of sound, the drum head's not tuning and you know, that, you know, hence your drum's not gonna tune and you're not gonna get the sound you want out of it. So the first thing the guys will do is they'll come in and they say, I need my edges cut. 
So that's really the number one kind of key repair. And even, even, you know, drums that are coming out of like, like high end factories sometimes can have issues. Uh, as soon as the wood starts to dry, they can twist a little bit, you know what I mean? So then it's, it's put on glass or actually a marble uh, top, kind of sand it down, we check it, and then I'll recut the edges to either factory spec or they'll say, oh, I want a little more tone. So you need a little more marriage between the head and the shell. So then you cut a little bit of a round over kind of thing. So as the drum head comes over, it marries on the shell, almost like a conga drum. So you're getting a lot more tone out of the drum. And then guys will want more attack. So you go for a sharper edge coming up. And when they hit the drum, rock and roll kind of stuff, you get a lot of attack without that kind of that big boomy bottom end kind of stuff. So, uh, so that would be the first thing that guys get done. And that'll kind of, that'll kind of dictate the sound of your drums. There's some drums that cutting the edges won't help. So if you're buying your Sears $100 drum kit and you're wondering at the gig, like every drum head I put on this, the drum sounds the same. It's like, yeah, because the shell is not designed. It was never designed to be, you know, a Ferrari. It was a Toyota or worse, whatever, whatever's down there. I don't know. I drive a PT Cruiser. What do I know? <laughs> like, man. So, anyway, so it could be like really down there. Uh, and you know, once it's made as a cheap entity, it, it, it can't be brought up. There's things you can do to increase it, make it better, but all your sound is coming from the shell. So if you're just, if you're starting with cheap drum shells that aren't made right, no matter what you do, they're going to have a very characteristic sound. Doesn't matter what drum head you put on it. When I design my stuff, I've, I've got three different drums, uh, uh, sorry, shells, and we'll kind of tailor it towards the drumming style that the guys are are in. Uh, and if they want to play a little bit of everything, you use a standard maple shell, which has been used forever. And it's kind of the, the standard to start with. Uh, and then I design my, my shells basically. So it'll be able to, you know, if you want to play a jazz gig with these things, you can put on the thinner heads on it, tune them up nice and high, you know, and you're into your jazz stuff, or you're playing a Metallica thing and you want to deaden the kit up and you can put on some heavy, you know, hydraulic drum heads or something on them. And then all of a sudden the drums are big and fat. So when you get into the better drums, they're going to have a wider tuning range. Um, and I'm sure that's probably with your vocals. Once you get your vocal lessons in, all of a sudden you can go from, you know, baritone or tenor baritone all the way up to, or how do I say, you can go from, hold on, let me think about this. You go from sting to, who's that, who's that guy with, like really low. The like, crash that dummies guys. Yeah, the crash, the hat guy's great, right? So he's like way down here and then you can go to Sting. So I don't know if you can get that vocal range, but, uh, but I try and build my drums to do that, right? So that we can get as much range so that with you, if you're paying four or $5,000 for a kit, again, you want it to last 20 years and you want it to work in every playing situation. Right. Do tuning lugs sense. make a big difference for the sound? The which one? Tuning lugs, like the amount oh. of tuning lugs. Yeah, it will. It will. I mean, everything you do to the drum will change the sound, right? And there's guys now that are putting on these like low mass lugs are made out of aluminum because they're just cheaper to do. And it's a whole marketing thing. It's like, hey, get the low mass lugs. It's a new thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, when when they're trying to copy the drum sounds of yesteryear, and they're talking about all oh, that great John Bonham sound or, oh, I want that old great jazz sound or I want this or that you got to study, you got to go back and study, well, what, what was on those drums? And all those drums would have had heavy die cast lugs on them, heavy hoops, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, lots of marriage between the head and the shell, so you get a lot of tone. So, and yet the marketing is like, oh, let's put these, you know, low mass lugs on it and use these cheaper shells. And I think sometimes, um, I don't know how it is in, in, the, in selling bass guitars or guitars, but um, with drums, I think there's too much trying to sell the sizzle, you know, like, oh, look, my drums are painted in this beautiful candy apple red and it looks great. You know, it's like that singer that'll come on stage all decked out, looking like a rock star and ready to sing. And then the first note he hits, you're like, oh man, <laughs> it's going to be that night. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We've got a few questions coming in from the audience here. So I'm going to squeeze those in because it's like they're coming in a little quick for me here. <laughs> okay. So, um, a question for Noreen. Um, can people get personal one-on-one -on -one coaching online? Yeah, that's pretty much all I do right now is we just link up our time zones and, and we show up online. And I, my students book their own, they find the time that's available and book it online and then we just show up. I usually do 
Skype. Well, I, I work on Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, um, anything that, you know, where we can communicate. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, and I would say the only, the only difference between that I've found the major difference between working in person and working on, on a screen is that generally only, only one of us can make sound at a time. So whereas if you're in person, I'll be playing the scales on the keyboard, you know, if we're doing technique, I'll be playing that um, along with you. But if I'm playing, I can't hear you. So it's kind of a, I kind of play you what you're supposed to sing and then you take a turn and then I tell you what to do next. So it's, it's, that's the major difference. And then if you're gonna sing a song, you need to just play the music from your end because if I play it from my end, I won't be able to hear you. But um, otherwise that's pretty much all my students are online right now. Okay, and do you evaluate a person's voice and give advice? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. That's the first thing I do is I take them through a series of kind of diagnostic exercises just to see where are we starting from. And then I find out through just questions like where do you, here's where we are, where do you want to go? And then, then I can come up with a plan. So if I, ha if I say I have a, a voice, I, I want to sing like Mariah Carey since that name's pop up so many times. I, if I say I want to do that, I'm going to go to you, Noreen, and go, Noreen, teach me how to sing like Mariah Carey. <laughs> yeah, and my response would probably, I would want to find out what aspects of that, that, like what about her voice, because I, you know, we already have a Mariah Carey and she's very unique and I can't, I can't really make anyone sound like someone else. Like I'm, what, what I'm going to do is give you the best version of your instrument because everyone's instrument's unique. And, um, and then if it's range you want, or if it's, oh, I like how she does this sound, or I like how she does her vocal riffs, you know, then we, we kind of get more specific and then find out, well, what, what is it you like about their sound and what, what would you like to figure out in your own voice? And that so the first question you got to always ask is why? Yeah. <laughs> why? Why do you want to sing like her? It's, yeah. it's been done. Yeah, like what you said, it's been done. We have a Mariah Carey, right? We already have one. Now yeah. let's yeah, make the you the best version yeah. of you that we can. That's all we can do. Yeah, I do that with the teaching as well. When I'm teaching, guys will come in and they're like, "Oh, I want to play this and I want to play this and I play that." And I'm like, "Okay, wait, wait a minute. We got to step back a few steps and start building up." your chops and your coordination skills so that you can play that. I mean, we yeah, do teach, groundwork. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, and I do teach a lot with, with play along tracks and, or guys will bring in a song and, you know, in the recording studio, we'll record them and then we put them up online because they're doing this kind of that, everyone's doing that online right now, the play along thing, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, look at me, I'm playing this, this uh, Led Zeppelin tune or something, right? So, so I've got students doing that right now and they don't have the technical abilities to do that so sometimes you can cheat by saying okay well john bonham played the bass drum on that song like this you can't do that so let's kind of simplify it you know what i mean so yeah. there might be what you're doing with vocals and i know when i took that my teacher goes okay so every time you're supposed to hit that note yeah don't do that go hit this note <laughs> you know because that note isn't working for you it doesn't work in your voice and you sound like you don't sound like Mariah Carey. So sing, <laughs> sing this note under here, right? So, so, and I'm sure you can do that with a, with a song as well. The song doesn't have to be exactly melodically the same because you hear guys do cover tunes or girls do cover tunes of, of songs and the, the, the melody is not exactly the same. They've kind of added their own thing to it, right? Mm -hmm. And is that based on their vocal abilities or just because they want to do that? Um, I, I, I actually, Often I ask my students uh, when I, I you know I'll say, okay, I, I want to just know what you're into. Can you sing me something that you're that you've worked up? And I'll ask them, did you do that cool thing you did with your voice because you chose it artistically and that that was the your most artistic creative expression, or did you ch choose to do that because that's the only voice your only thing your voice could do in the moment? And for me, it's, I always want it to be because I can do anything I hear in my head 
and I chose that because it was my artistic choice, not because my voice will only default there. And so right. I did that cool thing because I always do that cool thing. Right, right. Like okay, so, so variety. Okay, so here's a question for you. So, and I find this in my students, and, I, and this is interesting because I've never talked to a vocal teacher about this, but I have, there's, you have the class of students, the class or the group of students that when they come in and they want to play a tune, they want to play it verbatim, note for note, 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 note for note. And that mm -hmm. makes them think like they're totally fantastic because they played everything the way that Neil Peart played that on that Rush tune. And then you got other guys that are coming in saying, I kind of like that, but I want to add my own thing to it. And it seems like those two guys never mix, you know, and it's like bands. So I played in bands where guys like, no, we're going to play this song this way. Exactly right. Like this is the way it goes. Can't change it. No extra bars, no extra measures, hit every note. And then you got the band, other guys are going, Hey, let's just jam it out and see what happens. And then you go to the club and you play it the way you've been jamming it, you know? Uh, so do you find that a lot with, with vocal singers where they're like bang on, like they have to be exactly melodically correct? Hmm, that's, I don't know. It's, um, I have students who, I, I guess, yeah, personally, if they're learning a completely new vocal style, I will encourage them to find, yeah, I have like two schools of thought on this question. Um, <laughs> if, yeah, if they're totally learning a, a new style completely from scratch and they've done other things, I, I will say find the best person in that does this style you know like if you want to learn to sing jazz and you've never done it copy ella fitzgerald note for note every little nuance every every little thing she's doing copy it and then copy billy holiday or copy lena horn you know if it's female and, and um copy all these different people and as you do that you're gonna go oh well with ella i love what my voice feels like when it does this. So I'm going to pull right. that and make that mine. And I love what my voice feels like when I lean a horn does this. And so I'm going to pull that and make that mine. And then you kind of pull everything because my school of thought is also, we already have those singers and they're amazing. And so let's, let's figure out how you're amazing and right. pull things and make, let's figure out your unique instrument. And I also encourage my students to, to listen to like five covers of the same song and then create their own cover based on that. Like, I just think it's such a good exercise as a singer to, um, you know, and, and for me, I have something, I don't know, I, I hope I made this up. I feel like it's an original thought, but um, I call it planned improvisation where if I'm doing, uh, if I'm working up a song, I might work out three separate vocal riffs for a certain couple sections of the song and I work them into my voice so that they're, they're in my muscle memory and I can call them out but when I'm in the moment and I'm in front of the audience and I'm really feeling it and I'm telling the story I can pick which one I want to do in that moment based on like just how I'm feeling so I'm kind of throwing a whole different yeah, thing yeah. in there but, but yeah I'm kind of I don't find that as much with singers um, but I personally encourage singers to like find someone who mastered it, pull things you like from all these different people, yeah. but then find your own sound and cool. find and, and work on your ability to, uh, to create your own, your own unique version of right. songs. Cool. Good. That's what I do too. Yeah. I'm not, uh, and my memory is not good enough to remember, you know, all these tunes and all of a sudden play them verbatim. I mean, when I did the, yeah. When I did the Max, uh, Max tour, um, you know, two weeks before the gig, he sends me a list of 200 songs. He says, these, these are the songs we're playing. And we don't know which ones because every night they could change because the audience, because it was a jukebox tour. So they'd be calling out. So, you know, you got to be well versed. And so the first week is like writing charts like crazy, trying to figure out like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to play this. I'm going to play that. I shouldn't play that. And then woodshed for the other week. And then trying not to make a fool of yourself too many nights in a row, mm -hmm. basically, yeah. So talking about, I guess, getting your sounds, um, so Seppo, what would yeah. be uh, the difference between uh, name brand drum versus right. custom, like what you make? And there's a multiple other guys who are doing custom kits. But what's, yeah. what's the big difference? 
Yeah, I mean, you know what? I mean, yeah, there are a lot of guys that are building custom kits. Not so much in Canada anymore. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm probably the, the, the longest running company in Canada, singly owned. Uh, hasn't been like bought out or moved around or whatever, um, which makes me feel really old <laughs> to say that. It's like, man, yeah, okay, I've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, and there's some up upstart guys that are starting and they're, you know, learning the ropes and, you know, uh, their drums aren't necessarily, um, I don't want to put anyone's work, you know, there, you know, there's just things that they need to learn to take them to the next level. And we all do that. I mean, I'm learning stuff now and, and, you know, because I also record drums, um, uh, and I'm recording pretty much every, if not every day, every other day, I've got a kit set up. We're recording, we're tracking different musicians. So I'm always getting a chance to hear the other drums. I'm always getting a chance to hear guys bringing in their, their new $5,000 DW kit, or uh, I had a guy bring in his old, what we were talking about, the little pixie kit or whatever, bringing in a little Stewart kit. And we, and we recorded with that and it sounded great uh, because there's things you can do in the studio, you know, almost like auto tune on the vocals. You can kind of do a lot of stuff on the drums and cut certain frequencies out where it's like, okay, that's the bad frequency of that drum. And then you can kind of tune the drums up. So you can kind of find a, a pocket for everything. Right. Um, uh, and now I forgot the question. <laughs> what was, what was what, what's the difference? Right. Sorry. My brain's like Pew! a little ADD. Anyway. So, um, uh, you can tell, what was the question? What's the difference between a custom kit and a, right. a off the shelf kit? Right. Okay. So basically when you're buying a custom kit, you're buying a kit that's designed for you, for your sound, for let's say your gig or your tour, uh, that you're into. So, um, uh, like I'm building a kit for, uh, for a friend of mine, actually John Lum from, uh, from the Allman Brothers or Allman Betts Band uh, in, um, in, in Alabama. And they want a real specific kit for real specific sound because they're playing that kind of a vibe. So the drum sounds or sorry, the drum sizes are going to be very specific. Uh, so you can do some of that with an off the shelf kit but it's still not the same as having something custom built where you know all the components are going to fit together and they're all going to, there's no question about the kit not sounding cohesive or, or consistent. Whereas when you're buying a mass manufactured kit, generally those guys are the ones that are saying, okay, well, today we're going to build 10 inch toms and they put them on the shelf and tomorrow we're going to build 12s and then we'll build 14s and, you know, bass drums. And then when you order a kit, they'll just go, okay, let's boom, boom, boom. We'll take one of each. So you can be getting drums that aren't necessarily consistent, uh, whether it's even in color in the finish or, or in the sound. So it's the idea of, are you going to buy a Ford or are you going to buy a Lamborghini? You know, they both work. They're, you're, you know, they're both going to get you from point A to point B. They both take gas. You, you got to push the pedal on both of them. So, but a custom kit's going to give you that little extra bit of, you know, the steering wheels all leather and, you know, got a nice radio thing happening, you know what I mean? And the seats are comfortable and not sound, you know, not feeling like you're sitting on a little box or something. Right. So uh, ultimately you get what you pay for, but, um, but, but getting a kit custom built is, is, you know, obviously that's what I do. So, uh, uh, and by being able to play all those other kits out there, I know if people say, well, I have this Tama kit and I don't really like that sound. I know exactly why they don't like that sound because I know how that kit's been built. And they say, I want something that sounds a little more like a Gretsch kit. Then I know exactly what to do to get that sound or to pull that drum kit into those uh, tonal ranges. Right. Um, so basically, yeah, it's just, you're getting a better kit overall, hundred percent. And when should somebody start looking at getting the custom kit? Say that again. When should somebody start looking at getting the custom kit? Oh man. You know, guys right now that are ordering, the kits are probably a little bit older. I, they're either guys that have been touring forever and they're kind of like, you know what? They're tired of the endorsement. And because as an endorser, you get, you know, you're endorsed by Pearl or Tam or Yamaha or whatever. And, 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 and that's great. So when you're on tour, the drums are supplied for you. That's part of the whole endorsement thing. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of these guys aren't playing as much anymore. Well, no one's really playing now at all. But, uh, but, but you know, everything kind of, you know, you start playing less and they're like, look, I don't care about the endorsements. I don't care about anything. I just want a drum kit that sounds good. I want something that's designed for me. It's going to be my sound. And that's how come you go for a custom kit. Um, age, I don't think has a lot to do with it. I mean, I'm building, I built kits for, you know, and I hate building kits for 16 or 17 year olds because they're like, you know, they, they think they got all together and they, you know, at some point they just don't kind of respect 
the build, you know what I mean? Because they're still young, right? So you build them this beautiful kit. And then a year later, they're like, yeah, but I want that kit because my new favorite drummer plays that kit. You know what I mean? So it can be kind of flash in the pan-ish for, for the younger kids. So somebody um, like me can go pick up a really, a really great kit for half the price than when he wants to sell it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And you find that. You find that with, with every brand, though. I've seen DW yeah. kits right now that guys have spent or would have sold in the stores retail for six, 7000 bucks, And guys are selling for like, like two grand or 2500 so, and it just, it doesn't make the drum kit bad. It just means that the guy was looking for a different sound. So again, when you get the custom kit, I try and make it as diverse as possible. So if you want to play, you know, and tune it into jazz land, you can, if you want to tune it into heavy metal land, you can without necessarily feeling like, oh, this drum kit doesn't perform as a jazz kit or doesn't perform as a rock kit, let's say, you know? So ultimately that's what you're getting is you're getting that, that tuning range and that whole characteristic of just having, having a custom build for yourself. And what, what is the difference between a jazz kit and a rock kit? Uh, okay. Uh, depends on the jazz you're playing. Good question. Depends. If you're going back into, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, Art, Art Blakey, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The drums were, because they were a small combo, big band drums were big because you're playing yeah. with 28 piece orchestra. So the bass drum is a big 26 inch bass drum, big rack tom, big floor tom. Uh, when they started getting into the smaller jazz clubs, everyone for the, for the smaller kits, 18 inch bass drums, a little 12 inch Tom, a little 14 floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and generally jazz drums would be tuned wide open. Uh, just a regular thin head top and bottom. So there's a lot of tone. Um, and everything kind of has a little bit of a note value. So on an 18 inch bass drum, and I've seen videos of guys and that sometimes I don't like it on the bass drum. I've seen guys playing an 18 inch bass drum and it has, it's, let's say it's tuned to F, let's say. So every time you're hearing, you're hearing doom, 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 doom. Is that an F? I don't know. Doom, 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 doom. And it's all, so for the whole tune, you're just hearing this overriding, because there's so much tone coming off of it. So it can be kind of distracting, but generally the drums are smaller. They're tuned up a little bit higher uh, and they can speak a little easier without having to hit them hard. And they work with brushes. As soon as you get into a rock kit, you're getting into basically generally larger shells drum heads are dampened a little more. Uh, you're laying into them a lot harder. Uh, and if you're playing with brushes, forget it. They're not going to speak. They just don't, yeah. they're all dead, right? I mean, the heads are just kind of dead sounding. So really that's just it. High pitch, low pitch, right? Yeah. That makes sense? It does. All right. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, this is, this is getting interesting and I got so many questions that coming up okay. here. <laughs> okay. No, all good. All good. Yeah, but I do want to just tell everybody, um, welcome. If you're just watching right now, we are, you're watching GMI Hub. We are talking about, about instruments and what makes a great instrument. We have got Seppo, who is a drum artesian, I, aka he builds drums, builds, makes drums. He's all over drums. And, <laughs> and, Noreen, and Noreen Smith, uh, who is a vocal technician. And she's talking about the voice as an instrument. And I'm learning so much as I'm listening to both of them. But I know there's so many questions I've got to ask. Um, Seppo, I had a question for you from the audience. And it was, when it comes to rhythm installments, guitar, bass, drums, how important is it to know what the other guy is playing? And to add to that, I'm going to ask this. When it, thinking about the drum as an instrument, would you say that the person playing the drum is also part of the instrument? Yeah, yes, yeah, there's many planes to that. I'm thinking, okay, how are we, how are we gonna make this sit? But, but yeah, I mean, you have to, as a, uh, as a drummer, I kind of feel like we've got the biggest ears in the band because we're in the back, we have to understand what's going on. We have to know what the singer is singing. So while they're trying to sing, we're not doing a big drum fill. It tends to be a big problem. Sometimes it works depending on the music, but, but generally you have to listen to what the vocals are doing. And if there's something that, uh, again, depending on the, on the band or if it's a jam band, you can accent and help the singer, you know, by bringing up the intensity because they're taking the intensity up. So you can bring that up. So ultimately it's up to the drummer to drive the band, but we're driving, but we're listening. You know, does that make sense? Because, you know, uh, when I was, you know, with the penny merchants for years, right. And we'd be, we'd be playing, you know, I'm focused on, on, on Mike on the keyboard who's up front and you'd have to know, you know, if he drops his shoulder, 
you know, a little bit, he's giving you the cue that, Hey, we're going to pull back a little bit. You know, we always used to laugh. Like if we missed something, it's like, Oh, you didn't see him flick his eyebrow, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Like it was those kind of little subtle signals. Right. So, you know, after playing with the same band, you, you kind of find out and we could take a tune that we did on the, on the, uh, on the CD, like a three or four minute tune. And I've got, I've got stuff of us where we played that tune for like 20 minutes. You know, because we're because now Mike is engaged with the audience, finding out what's happening. This is in the praise and worship thing, right? Like where they're going, and then cueing us, and then it's up to me to run with those cues and then build it up or bring it down. Because ultimately, if Mike's trying to bring it down and then the drummer's still hammering away, you know, Mike's going to look at me like, "What? what? <laughs> like, aren't you listening at all?" You know what I mean? So the drummers, we we have to have the biggest ears, and it's the most important for us to understand. Uh, which is why I always tell drummers, you got to learn a different instrument anyways. I mean, you should have piano training for sure. If you can sing, awesome. Um, you know, guitar, bass, anything else that'll help you to understand. Um, and there's been times when I'm playing the guitar and I've had a drummer, and this is years ago, playing, and I didn't realize how much drummers will noodle. You know, they're just like, you're talking, drummers in the back, you know, practicing his paradiddle and the rest of the band's trying to talk, you know? And I remember doing that, looking at the drummer going like, stop, what do you, stop, we're talking, you know, that kind of thing, right? So it is important. And I think, I, I, I think we've got the biggest ears and we have to have the biggest ears. You know, singers, not so much because they're, you know, sorry, <laughs> singers just seem to be like, hey, I'm worried about, you know, my, my vocals. Did I drink my tea? Am I going to hit this note? Guitar players are like worried about, hey, look at my shoes. You know, I got a great looking guitar, you know, stuff like that. They're not, they don't care. They're the, they're the stars, you know, whereas, whereas the rhythm section in the back, we got to be listening, right? And then understand the flow of the music. So yes, we have to be part of not only playing the drums and, and playing the music, but being real in the music, like actually in the music, if that makes sense. That, that makes sense. Awesome. Noreen. Okay. I'm going to combine a whole bunch of questions into one. Body <laughs> shape and health, um, are, are, that's actually two questions in one here. Does body shape matter in order to have a good voice? Um, I, so. Have Roddy. No. <laughs> <laughs> so body shape, not so much. Vocal tract shape, yes. So um, interesting little fact is if we had, if, if we have the vocal cords all by themselves without a vocal tract, um, they would sound like, like when you uh, pull the edges of a balloon and let the air out, that squeaky sound. So that's what the vocal cords sound like all by themselves. And then when you put them in a specific size and shape of vocal tract and size and shape of the larynx and the, the Adam's apple and, and you know how big the, vo the vocal cords are generally about the size of your thumbnail. So they're not very big and they don't make a lot of sound by themselves. It's the unique shape and length of the vocal tract and the mouth. So, um, so Body type, not really, doesn't matter. Um, but vocal tract shape is unique to everybody. And that's what makes your unique sound. So when people talk about, so when people talk about you have to have, and I knew of someone a long time ago that said this, I don't care about my body shape as long as I have the abdomen to support my vocal cords and all this other stuff. So do you, like, is that true? Like, do, do they need to have, you know, the abdomen to support their vocals and so okay. forth. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, competing schools of thought when it comes to uh, breath support and that, that whole topic. Um, I'm kind of like all of the above. However, um, for me, what I find is that that breast support and, and strength in the abdominal area is secondary. It's, it's really important, but it's not the most important because if you have, uh, if you're singing with vocal cords that are constantly um, squeezed by different muscle groups that shouldn't get involved or, um, or there's tension in there, the more support you add to an unhealthy situation, the worse it's gonna get. So my job, is one of my one of my big major jobs with a singer is to 
kind of uncover the voice and get rid of all of the things that are possibly inhibiting it and causing tension. And then once this is free of all of all of those outside things that don't need to be there, then we work on adding support. I kind of think of it, I, I usually put it like, imagine you've never lifted weights before. And so you start with the barbell and you just, or you start with just the, you know, the, um, yeah, I guess it's a barbell. That's what I'm, that's the word I'm looking for. No bar. <laughs> and, and you practice your form first. And as your form gets solid, you gradually add weight and add more weight until you can, you can put a, you know, handle a lot of weight. And for the vocal cords, uh, weight equals air pressure. So, so when you have the vocal cords here, and then you have this air pressure that they're resisting, if there's a lot of tension, then adding weight's gonna make that, take that form and, you know, if the form's bad, adding air pressure is gonna make it worse. Adding weight is gonna make it worse. So um, I think, yeah, I'm in a situation where I almost forgot the question again. I just kind of got lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, so I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. <laughs> 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 It was a question about body shape and then the adding to that was just like when people talk about the school of thought of you have to have the abdomen to support you know the, the breath thing and all that which which leads to the next question which is what exercises would you recommend i mean most people when you say exercises the first thing that comes to mind and i'm guilty as charged um would be say well you've got to practice your breathing and you got to practice this but based on what you're saying practicing breathing maybe just practicing something to to bring out the worst of a, of a situation that hasn't been uncovered yet. So what exercises would you recommend? Yeah. Um, okay. So there, there's some really great science that's come out in the last, I don't know, five years or so um, about what are the best vocal warmups and, and what do those look like? And there's a, there's a vocal scientist by the name of Dr. Ingo Tietze, and he's, he's just started unpacking all the, the physics. He's writing scientific papers on it. And, um, and so I've just kind of been following some of his research and some of the people that he's been working with. And um, he's done all sorts of experiments on what is the ideal way to, to warm up your voice. So, um, I mean, it helps if you've worked with a voice teacher and you kind of have been able to get your form right, but um, there's, there's kind of um, two different ways to warm up that, that lead to the same thing. So, and one of them, I actually brought one with me because I thought it would come up, is, um, is through a straw. This is like a coffee stir stick straw. It's really, really thin. Um, so you can do, you can do this. Um, I just do little, uh, like I'll start with a five tone scale, just a, and then I'll do a series of, of covering the whole range. And those sort of things. Um, so there's this, or you can do kind of like a, a boba size straw, like the big straws into a cup of water. And they both basically accomplish the same thing. What they do is, so again, here's, these are my vocal cords, represent my vocal cords. So you have the air pressure that the vocal cords are resisting from the lungs. And then by using either the small straw just in, with the air or um, singing into that large straw into water, what happens is you get this feedback of not only of, of air, but of sound waves that so you have you have these uh, you have the air pressure from the lungs and then this feedback of air pressure and sound waves that massage the vocal cords and and I've watched videos from that uh, you know uh, people who study the voice have taken a vocal cords even like if you uh, if if you've been speaking for a while or singing for a while and your voice is a little irritated and, and um, they've taken before and after using these methods because they accomplish the same thing. And you can see kind of red irritated vocal cords and then the after of five, five or 10 minutes of these little exercises and, uh, and they're you know, all happy again. So, and I've experienced it myself. It's, it's just, uh, 
it's been so fun to discover that. And uh, I use that as my warm up all the time. I use different scales, different, you know, so you want to start with good form, but this also, it's hard to sing with a lot of tension when you have that double air pressure effect. So um, it's kind of a good place, a good starting point for anyone. So um, yeah, those two, the little tiny straw or into the air or the big straw into water. And, and what that, if I have a kazoo, will that work? A big kazoo? Do you remember that? <laughs> not really, yeah, it's yeah. not quite the same effect, but uh, a little more fun maybe. I would, I would, yeah, I like when you did that, woo, I can do that yeah. with a kazoo, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little more entertaining. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> nice party <laughs> trick. <laughs> Yeah. How can someone know if they're not just someone who sings in the shower, but they are really someone that can sing? Like, how would you know? Or how can someone know? I mean, someone who sings in the shower feels like they're a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you have all those acoustics feeding your voice back to you. And yeah. um, I don't know. I um, it, Every individual is different, but I can tell you that from my students, I always tell them um, it depends on how badly you want it because every vocal, pretty much, unless it's like a really serious vocal injury, every vocal issue has a logical fix. So if you don't like the tone of your voice, we can fix it. If you don't like, if you feel like your range isn't big enough, we can fix that. Like there's, there's so many elements we, and if, uh, your voice is like, if you think it's boring, we can figure that out and make it really interesting. Help you figure out how do I tell a story when I'm singing and draw an audience in. There's all of those elements uh, are something we can do something about. So if someone, I would just say if someone is really teachable and they want it badly enough and they're willing to put in the work and the time because it might mean that that you work with someone like me for three years or two years and and then until you start feeling like, oh, I'm amazing, you know, or it could be that that in a handful of lessons, I can take you from A to B because the building blocks were already there. There, wa there wasn't months of things to undo before we got there. You know, it really, it's so individual, but I generally tell people if you're teachable and you want it badly enough, and you know what you want, we can get you there. You just, it's all about teachability and willingness to work hard. So I've got a couple more questions for both of you. Um, I'll go to Seppo here. Um, yeah. What do you look for when you're looking to buy a new kit? If you're somebody who's gonna still start looking to buy a new kit, right? what would they look for? Well, you know what, it, it always, it's always gonna end up being budget. Budget's okay, always- I'll, I'll even do this. And even if it's a used kit, so somebody's going, I can't afford yeah. a nice kit, but I can yeah. afford a nice used kit. What would you look for? Uh, for? First of all, I mean, it depends on, on, on your gig situation. So if you're going to be playing in church, and I've set up a lot of churches with kits where they've had the completely wrong kit in the church, like sizes, shells, uh, the way they've been treated, the drum head. So then they, you know, then they got the drummers that are, playing maybe a little too hard or the cymbals are too heavy. So they got to throw them in a little booth and a little cage to keep them kind of caged in, you know what I mean? So, and then keep the volume down. Um, but the first thing that you got to look at is, is what gig you're playing and then try and get, or what sounds you like, let's say from your favorite drummers or whatever. And then, and then try and hone into, you have to start with what they were playing because you happen to like their sound. So, you know, you like Lars Ulrich from Metallica and you're going to go, well, he's playing a Tama kit. So let me go try out that kit. Uh, and then because everyone has their starter kit, intermediate kits and, the, and their professional kits, that's all based on budget. So if you're playing a top end Tama kit or the bottom end Tama kit, they're not going to sound the same. It'll have the same name brand on the front, but it's not going to be the same sounding kit. Um, so it does come down to, I always look at the first thing, if I'm, if I'm telling someone first, find out what your budget is, uh, give me a list of drummers you like and sounds that you like or albums that you like or whatever. And then, uh, you know, I've got like 15 or 16 kits at the shop all the time and I've got different brands and we can set them up, like depending on how serious the guy is and what we need to go through, 
we'll set up different drums, listen to different drums, try different drums, uh, put different heads on the drums to see what kind of characteristics we can come up with, or try and rework their kit and say, hey, we can take your kit and with even minimal amounts of money, we can kind of make that better if they like the sizes and everything else. So obviously first thing is, is your sound, what you're going for. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, outfitting with the drum heads that are proper to, again, to the venue or, or, or to what you're playing. Uh, and then find out how much money you got. You got to basically, I always say people buy the best you can afford. And if that's a thousand dollar kit, then look for a great kit used for a thousand dollars, you know, um, and if you can afford a better kit, obviously it's going to last longer. It's not going to be a 10 year kit. It might be your life or kit because you know, again, it's going to have that tuning range and have all the sounds and capabilities that you're going to want. Okay. And for Noreen, um, what would be your recommendations when somebody's looking for a vocal coach? What would you be telling them to look for in a coach other than somebody yourself? Yeah. Um... what you're looking for. Sometimes there's, there's a team needed. Like my strengths personally are getting are working out all the, the vocal issues and making sure a singer has freedom in the voice and artistry and can do whatever, you know, whatever they intend to sing will come out the way they intend it. But then I'll send someone to if say if if they're into musical theater and they need to get their audition book together and they uh, like that's not I don't know every single musical theater piece that's perfect for baritone and you know in a certain genre of musical theater like that's not I uh it's, it's not my area of expertise so um so I do teach every every genre but I'm not going to be like the the expert of you know r and b like here's your five songs you need to know to gig as an r and b singer um, but generally if you're if you're looking just to improve the voice you have um, you don't want someone who's just going to be like a cheerleader and be like, "Oh, you're already great and here's here's another song here's another song when you have vocal issues that you that you know if they can't help you with the actual vocal issues you have then you want to you want to find someone else um so yeah if if you can if they can help you articulate what your goals are vocally and then um and then be able to actually get you there or at least in the first couple of lessons you should have some sense of of like I understand this and I see where we're going and it makes sense and I already experience a change in my voice. There, there should be some element of like, this has made, finally makes sense and I see where we're going and I see the plan that we made together makes sense. Okay, yeah. and then I'll, I'll just stay with one more question for you. And with all this training that the, the vocalists are working on, I always keep hearing them going, but they can fix it when I go into the studio with all the electronics. <laughs> no, they can't. No, no I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but like to agree, there's truth to that. But how far off are people when they're thinking of that? When it's like, yeah, they can fix it. And I know there's little bumps here and there that they can. But are they people really wishing for miracles when they are saying that? Yeah, well then, those are the people um, who, if if what they recorded in the studio did really well, and now they're being sent out on tour by the record company, yes, and yes, they're like, "Hey, I did thirty takes over two weeks to get this right, and then they tweaked it, and now I have to do this on tour, and I'm terrified." Then that's when they need me to come in to get, you know, and, and usually it's like three months out. I'm like, how long do we have? <laughs> and then it's like three months out. I'm like, I think we can do it. And then we, we just work until they can do what they did on the album because now they have to do it live. And it's terrifying because they're like, yeah, I took so many takes 
and it was so hard and I had two weeks to pull it off in the studio and I finally got it and then we tweaked it. Um, to me, I just, it, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do what you're doing? And I mean, and there's stuff like there's, now we have real time pitch correction. Yeah, so yeah. You auto tune live, yeah. And be a little pitchy and what comes out of the speakers is going to be in tune. But, you know, if there's enough tension and the pitchiness is bad enough, you're going to hear that little glitch. You're gonna, the audience is going to hear it. So, I, yeah, I always think it's just so much better to actually have that control over your instrument and be able to do what you're doing. Because what if, what if this is really successful and now you have to do it live? And that's, I've worked with people like that before and, um, I've had, I had a band uh, who, yeah, their label just said um, they sound amazing on their album, but we can't send them on tour because they sound awful in person. And I was like, okay, how long do we have? And we, yeah. had, we had three months and they were able to get through a tour and nail it because we had time. And, but then I've also had artists call me from the road and they didn't prepare and now they're they're three shows in to a 25 show tour and their voice is gone and they're having to cancel shows and that's never good i like yeah. if, you know there's some stuff we can do but you're gonna have to cancel shows until we sort it out so i my school my thought is always just, you know, if, if your voice, if you can work towards your voice doing this for real, it's going to be better in the long run, generally for everybody. Just when you use that example, I was thinking of a story of someone who I didn't know personally, but I heard an artist on the road lost their voice. And maybe Daryl, you remember this, this person drank something. Oh, yes. Do you know what it was? Yes. He drank something that was that peroxide. Peroxide. What? He had mucus and oh. cleaned him out for the. It was it was a showcase wow. to get a contract with the record company. This is I think the seventies, the eighties, and he goes, oh, I had man. to. Peroxide cleaned it out. He said I went out. I did the five minutes. He goes, I couldn't speak for four days afterwards. He yeah. Said, I didn't want yeah. to, but he goes, I got the contract. I got the gig. And he oh, goes, man. I'm still doing it to this day because I was stupid at that moment. <laughs> Yeah, well, and someone, someone like Steven Tyler, yep. um, he gets, he still gets uh, steroid shots into his vocal cords before a show, so he can do what he does, wow. and then, and then he can't speak after. Yeah, yeah. But that yeah. makes me ask the question: um, What should someone drink or not drink? Because there's again more theories, more thoughts about that. Avoid some say avoid the milk products. Some say drink the milk products. Some say have honey. Some say don't have honey. Some say you know. There's just so many thoughts. What would you tell someone to 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 drink? I guess to consume to help or assist their voice. If if that if there's anything that can do that. Um, yeah, I I generally tell someone you know like if if you notice that you're really phlegmy after dairy then don't eat dairy before you sing. Um, across the board, I would highly recommend lemon water because it lemon removes mucus from the, from, you know, your body and it, it gets rid of it. Um, Does it matter and, the temperature? And not, what's that? Does it matter the temperature of the water? Hot, yeah, cold? Not, not cold, no ice. Mm, okay. Yeah. Should be like body temperature or you could have tea or something. Um, for people who can do organic honey, that also is, um, is helpful in removing mucus and then your vocal warm up. So yeah, if something, if you notice that certain foods or certain food groups affect, maybe, maybe um, for me, if I eat anything uh, made with corn, I wake up the next day with swelling and my vocal cords are swollen. So I, well, I generally don't eat it anyway because I don't like being swollen. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, if, if certain foods, if you are observant and you notice that certain foods affect you either immediately or in days afterward, then when, you, when you're coming to, you just have to be in touch with your body and know 
know how your particular body responds to food. So um, yeah, some people have no reaction to dairy. And I'm like, if that's fine, go for it. If there's no, yeah. So it's kind of individual, but across the board, I'd say uh, squeeze like a whole lemon into a big thing of water and you can drink it either hot or body temp and yep. um, or lukewarm. Now that's for that's for uh, for live stuff because in the, because in the studio we've had guys where it's like they want a specific sound or a texture out of their voice. So we've done stuff where it's like okay, eat a whole bag of potato chips, no water. Have you ever heard that kind of stuff? And then we've had other guys. Okay, you know they're we're doing a tune and they want it to be like rushed and and you know a little bit out of breath. So we had him run around the block twice and he comes in right to the microphone and he starts singing and he's like gas. So it so it does create a whole different kind of a vibe for it. Yeah. And I heard something on that Amy Grant record years and years and years and years ago where it was like they had done that to her. They made her eat a certain kind of brand of potato chip. I don't know if you ever heard that. You would probably know all the rumors that circle around. That. I, I heard with Amy Grant the it was. She was doing, she just had her child and she was doing the record and they knew they had to stop time. So she got to uh, go feed the child. Oh, really? We okay. We could hear the change in her voice. Oh, time to go. And Oh, really? I didn't hear know. that. Yeah. I heard the potato chip one as well. So we've done everything in the studio. We've had guys drink milk or not milk or, you know, uh, I hate to say it. I've, I've worked with singers. It's like, I can't sing unless I get a couple of shots of scotch. So they put back a little bit of scotch and then they start singing because I don't know the alcohol or whatever. I don't know. You know, I mean, but it does change a little bit of the, that tone in their voice, which is, which is almost as easy as just changing a microphone at that point, but, right. but mm. it does give you something else, right? Yeah, yeah, like um, coffee and alcohol will uh, dehydrate your body, so your, your vocal cords won't be as hydrated, so they'll be a little bit thinner and not, so if, if that's a sound you wanna go for, um, it's, it's really more of a dehydrated sound is, right. is what you have. And then, yeah, some people, uh, need a little bit of scotch before a performance because then they don't have their their nerves aren't taking over right but yeah, but it yeah. does yeah coffee and alcohol will will just dehydrate you in general right. and um and then water takes a while to to get to your cells it's not an immediate thing like you drink water and it's and it fixes everything like the lemon water um is deeply hydrating with the lemon but but it'll take I don't know, like a half hour or 40 minutes to get to your cells. So some people use those little uh, misters, um, yeah. like the kind that you can put medication in if you have asthma. And because you want those, you want the, the not just like your regular uh, VIX mister, you want the ones with the really, I don't have one on hand, but there's certain, there's tiny particles in the those ones and they they actually go and and uh they go directly to your vocal cords and hydrate immediately that's kind of the only thing that does it immediately unless i take a drift scan thing and go boop boop and like put, she put it <laughs> into the sinuses and i can sing that's that's my secret i'm gonna i'm gonna try that i'm gonna see if that works <laughs> i'll let you know <laughs> okay. Okay, I have one more question for Seppo here, um, and it was kind of the same line that uh, yep. I asked Marine. And so I just spent three to five thousand dollars on my drum kit. Why would I do that, especially if I'm playing bigger shows and doing a lot of studio recording, when I can get the same sounds from the samples or the new latest drum pack? Right. Well, you know what? Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, it depends on the studio you're recording at and it depends on how the engineer and producer want to produce your sound. Me being an engineer and being an old school engineer, I still like microphones. I like to position mics. So if I want a different sound, I don't reach to my console and start working the sounds. And, and then on the computer, having to dial things in and all sorts of compression and stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of old school. I like to like set up the drums, have it, they, they got to sound good acoustically in the room that you're playing in uh, with you know proper set of heads, everything ready to go so that if you're walking around the drum kit and the drummer is playing, just by where you are in the room, you know where you can start placing room mics or whatever or close micing the drum kit or bringing, uh, bringing the mics out. On a, on a more expensive kit or a better kit, let's say, that's easier to have happen. You can have that if, you're, if your engineer is doing his, his job right, you'll be able to take that kit and make it sound decent with or great 
without having to augment it with samples and all sorts of EQ and compression and stuff like that to bring out certain characteristics. If you go in with your Westbury Pixie Sears kit, whatever we were talking about earlier, if you go in with that and um, you know things aren't sounding good, then yeah, then you can put the triggers on it and kind of help that process. Uh, with, the, with the technology and recording, I can even take the audio file of a kick drum and just resample it, blow in a sample, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of you know, spending $5,000 on a drum kit. Exactly. Right. So, so it really depends on what you're planning on doing with it. Me being a drummer, I want my drums to be great. Uh, I want them to sound good all the time. Uh, and I guess that old saying, you're only as good as your last gig. So, right. you know, if someone hears you behind the kit and they love the sound of your drums and the way that you're approaching your playing and bringing the sound out of the drum kit, then they're going to say, yeah, that guy's really cool. It's just not necessarily about chops because as long as your timing's good. And when I teach, I always teach like the three things that separates the men from the boys and the drumming aspect of stuff. But, but, but ultimately at the end of the day, the drums got to sound good and you've got to sound comfortable from behind that kit. And if it's on a thousand dollar kit or a $300 kit, then, uh, then great. But, uh, but for me, I think, you know, the better kit you have, the better chance you have of being able to record, get those drums sounding good without worrying about, you know, do I need triggers? What kind of microphones do I need? How are we going to process that? It just saves time in the long run in the studio. Right. Um, I, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. One more question. I know that we are, we normally would be off the air right now, but just one more question. This one's for yeah. Noreen. And this is from the audience. Uh, someone wants to know, do vocal cords naturally degrade? There's like four questions actually. Okay, do they naturally degrade? And does one have to alter their, their singing as time goes on? Um, I guess because of age. And then there's more questions. Is, it, is, is this a practice thing or is there a natural change that is inescapable? So I have three questions from one person. <laughs> so, <laughs> So the first question, do your vocal cords naturally degrade? Yes. However, um, the rate at which they degrade uh, depends on genetics, diet, uh, what health issues you're struggling with. Um, I mean, as, as we age, everything loses elasticity. So, you know, I'm noticing that <laughs> lately. <laughs> Um, so everything in our bodies generally progresses towards losing elasticity, including our vocal cords. So, uh, but if you have different health issues, they can make it worse sooner. Um, like for me, I, I did as much as I could with vocal technique, um, because I had all these vo vocal issues for years that I just couldn't figure out. And then I finally figured out that, oh, having adrenal fatigue and a thyroid disease, and which led to an extreme case of acid reflux that led to an acid reflux disease called Barrett's esophagus, which is pretty serious. Um, I mean, adrenal fatigue made my vocal cords really really tired and kind of droopy all the time. I couldn't get any energy in them. And then uh, having a thyroid that didn't work properly gave me kind of a raspy voice and I lost vocal range. And then having acid reflux meant my vocal cords were always irritated and red and swollen. And so uh, there was only so much vocal technique I could use and my vocal cords just didn't work. And um, I could get to a certain point just that's why I obsessed about vocal technique at first is because like I don't know why my voice doesn't work and then it turned out that a combination of vocal technique and then um, changing my diet in a way that um, actually reversed all of the diseases that I had is bringing my voice back so so diet hydration can kind of keep it at bay. If, you're, if your body's healthy and your skin's healthy, then your vocal cords should work for a long time. But yeah, if you're chronically dehydrated or you have different health issues that cause issues with your vocal cords, then 
losing elasticity, I think will, will happen a little earlier. And then there's always some genetics that happen that come to play. But there are things you can do to improve and, and keep your voice just at peak shape for as long as you possibly can. But then once you hit, you know, 85, 90, there's not much you can do. Just be glad you live that long and you're still singing. <laughs> so that explains why some singers that are well known to sing in their young ages way super high um, basically now can't do that because their elasticity has gone down. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Okay. So we, I'd love to find out your diet, but I'm not going to take any more time on air. <laughs> I am going to thank um, both you, Noreen, for sharing your knowledge and Depo. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and, and sharing your knowledge about instrumentation and how we can use the instruments that we use, whether voice or drums, um, and using them uh, and, and making them better and using them to the best of our abilities. And audience, we want to thank you for tuning in with us. It's been absolutely awesome having you here. Thank you for sending in your questions. That was absolutely awesome. And um, I just want to remind you that if you're seeing this on Facebook, we will also be showing this on YouTube. So please, if you're viewing this on YouTube, go ahead and like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And so you will always know when we are going to be putting up another new, uh, new video and get some more help on the things that relate to you. If you have any thoughts about what you would like to see GMI Hub cover, um, send us a message right in the comments. Let us know what's going on. We have a brand new website. Um, go check it out at www.gospelmusicindustryhub.com. And you already know, may know that we have been accepting submissions or at least intent for submissions for a Christmas compilation project. We've said today is the last day to, to submit or to at least let us know if you're going to submit a song. But you know what? We'll be nice. We'll give you one more day. So if you can let us know by midnight tomorrow that you're going to submit a song, then please send it to song at gospelmusicindustryhub.com. All you need to know is you're going to submit a song so we know to expect it. That's all I'm going to say for all my commercials. <laughs> you know, thank you, Daryl, for taking the lead on this bonus feature Monday. We will be back next week talking about music and ministry in churches and and what's going to happen for Christmas. Ah, okay. So um, until then, you guys have a great week. God bless. And we'll see you next time.